Go. Hello, my dear students. I want to briefly demonstrate balancing equations as we enter into our study of reaction stoichiometry and give you um, a couple of examples directly from some of the homework about how you can make these um, calculations, these determinations, so that the two halves of the equation are balanced. We'll hardly ever go over 10, and I promise on the test you won't have to take your shoes and socks off. I'll keep all the numbers in our examples on the test to 10 and under. So you can count them on your fingers. You can have a calculator if you want, but you really don't need one. And there are some uh, paths for you to follow and some instructional ideas. It's like solving a crossword puzzle. You get a little bit and that gives you a clue to the next one. You make mistakes and you have to go back and choose, instead of a different word like a crossword puzzle, a different coefficient for your different substances in your reaction. But let's just go ahead and work one and look at some of the things I'm looking for. In one of the previous videos we had this example because we wanted to use these different uh, compounds and elements and molecular uh, forms of hydrogen, so also its elemental form, um, to calculate uh, atomic mass and uh, molar mass for molar quantities of both um, pure elements and compounds. But here we're looking at a reaction where we dissolve iron into sulfuric acid, make a salt, iron sulfate, iron 3 sulfate, and a gas. Little bubbles of gas come out when you drop a piece or some iron into a solution of sulfuric acid, especially concentrated sulfuric acid. So, <coughs> what I want to do is balance this equation. I know a few things, and that is, this is pure elemental iron, and in the end, I'm going to need two. And a good place to start, and I would do this in pencil if I didn't know the answer already, would just say, be to say, I need two irons. Okay? And I'm going to need three sulfates. Because look, for every two irons, there's three sulfates. This is the classic example of a plus three and a minus two. So this is iron three and sulfate, as you can tell when you look it up on your chart of polyatomic ions, is always minus two. And so this is something we find all the time. Aluminum is plus three, so always look for a plus three and a minus two with aluminums. Uh, another good example might be calcium phosphate where calcium is always plus two, but the phosphate is always minus three. So you're going to need, in this case, two plus three irons to balance the charge on the three minus two sulfates. You have plus six, minus six, and the compound ends up neutral as it should be. Not every problem is going to be written and give you this. It might be a pure word problem where they say elemental iron is added to concentrated sulfuric acid and they don't give you any of these um, chemical formulas. You have to know the rules of naming to deduce the chemical formula. Okay? Um, you know, to give iron 3 sulfate plus molecular hydrogen. So, but I knew that I need three of these sulfates, so let me try three of those sulfuric acids. Now that would result in one of these, but look what I have. You know, six hydrogen atoms. But it wouldn't be, wouldn't be six, would it? Um, you know, I have three sulfates here, so, you know, this is going to, um, need two irons, I need three of those sulfates, and that will give me three H2s. So my coefficients are two, three, one, and three. Okay, so I've balanced my equation. Let me show you a couple of other examples. 
and we'll come back to this particular reaction in the next video when I want to talk about um, what happens, how we use our stoichiometry when I say, okay, I don't have two moles of iron. What happens if I only have one mole of iron? Or what if I don't have stoichiometric amounts of my two reactants? Instead of a 2 to 3 ratio, what happens if I have a 3 to 4 ratio? What becomes limiting and how much product can I make? Those are the kind of questions that chemists ask every day and that we want to answer with um, the kind of problems we're working as we study stoichiometry. So let me work two more problems very quickly. Um, in this particular one, this is one we're going to do in our 8 solution lab where we add iron chloride, a nice yellowish solution, to a solution of lead nitrate. We'll be working with lead. I want you to make sure that we work with small amounts. We're going to be working with dropper, you know, sized amounts, drops of it. But once again, lead is extremely toxic, so we will wash our hands when we're done with this. But um, we're going to make iron nitrate and an insoluble precipitate, lead chloride which is PbCl2, so it's lead 2 chloride. This is lead nitrate. It's lead 2 nitrate. So we didn't have any change in oxidation states. This is iron 3 chloride. There is a iron 2 chloride, which is FeCl2, of course. But um, So we have iron plus 3 and lead plus 2. So, you know, we're going to have that same 2 to 3 probable ratio. So I'm going to take 3 of the plus 2s and 2 of the plus 3s and see what I turn out. Well, I had 2 irons here, so let me put 2 irons there. And each one of those has 3 nitrates. Each one of these had 2 nitrates, but there were 3 total. And now I'm going to have 3 leads and six chlorides, because it's PbCl2, so that would be six chloride ions total. And over here, each compound of the iron three chloride had three chlorides, but I had two of them. So all my atoms add up. Remember, I'm following, you know, certain laws, and matter can either be created or destroyed, and this equation, this plus this, we use, instead of an equal sign, an arrow in chemistry, but it's like a mathematical equation. The two sides have to balance. Yes, we're, you know, rearranging things, but in the end, we can either, you know, create or destroy atoms until we get to the chapter on, you know, nuclear chemistry, at least. And when we do these reactions, the number of atoms on each side has to be equal. The mass of the reactants has to equal the mass of the products. So, um, we'll see that in some of the problems we're going to work. Here's another one. Ammonia plus oxygen produces NO plus H2O. This one, you, you know, when I look at one like this and, and try to work it, I know, uh-oh, I have three hydrogens here, and I'm only going to have even numbers over here. You know, so I'm in inclined to say, well, let's, let's try and find, you know, three here and two here. Maybe six or twelve would be a common denominator. And when you try six and put a three here, it doesn't work out. So I'm going to start with a six there. So I have a total of 12 hydrogens and 6 oxygens here but I have some more oxygens over here so worry about those in a minute let me deal with my hydrogens first um, I tried it with 3 it didn't work so now I have 6 hydrogens I mean 6 waters and that gives me 12 hydrogen atoms to get 12 hydrogen atoms I would need 4 ammonia molecules NH3 is the gas, um, ammonia, and now 
you know, I have 12, and I had four of these ammonias, so I'm going to do four NOs over here, and um, nitrogen monoxide, would it be its official name, nitric oxide. This um, gives me six oxygens here, plus four oxygens in these compounds here, so... You know, 6 and 4 is 10. Now, this is molecular oxygen, or O2. So I need 10 oxygen atoms, but I will need 5 of these. You know, that, that one was kind of hard, I admit it. But all you can do is um, follow the guidelines from the book and from the notes, and do your best, and if something doesn't work, try something different. Like I said, I saw here that I had 3 hydrogens here and 2 there. So I tried, you know, that common, not denominator, but, you know, when you multiply 2 times 3, you get 6. I tried a 3 here, but it didn't work out when I tried it. So I just went up and tried a 6, and that time, or this time, it worked. So balancing equations sometimes takes a little trial and error, but like I say, we need small whole number um, coefficients, and in this class and for 99% of most chemical reactions anyway, um, we're not going to go into double digits. You know, for chemical reactions to happen, molecules have to hit together and interact, and they have to do it in, in, in a certain geometry. And when you get 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 of them going, now you can do it sequentially in steps, so you need to look at reaction mechanisms in a more advanced class, but you're not going to have a collision where these things are going to react to form new products where huge numbers have to come together in a special spatial geometry. So, you know, it is kind of cool. We can work with basically small whole number coefficients when we balance our chemical reactions. So, like I say next time, what would happen if I added more ammonia? If I had five moles of ammonia? react with five moles of oxygen. But what would happen if I had five moles of ammonia and only four moles of oxygen? And how much product would I make? You may not care on a reaction like this, but if it's making an important um, product for some other use or for sale, then our ratios become more and more important to us, and when we want to have a good, complete reaction without any waste, we also um, need to think about those considerations frequently in the lab. So this is a real-world skill that chemists have to master to be effective um, laboratory investigators. So we're going to move on to calculating different stoichiometric ratios in the next video, and then talk about a concept in the video after that called the limiting reagent. We'll also discuss briefly chemical yield, because we always want to know how much we're going to make. You know, or if I know how much I need, I need to be able to calculate how much of the starting materials I need. How much I need to order, how much I need to mix together, what size reaction vessel I'm going to use, whether it's a pilot plant in a lab with tens of liters or a pilot plant in the plant with hundreds to thousands of liters to I told you when I was the Yale Selenese Biotechnology Fellow um, many many years ago there's a plant in Texas that produces a million gallons of acetic acid a day. I don't even know where you would put a million gallons but my, you put it in tank cars and you ship it north, but um, my point is that um, when you're talking those kinds of quantities and you aren't efficiently following your stoichiometric ratios, you're just mixing stuff together and hoping you get enough product, then you're costing real money and wasting real resources when you do that. So balancing equations is a real world, real life skill that chemists need to master, and we will go on to look at this topic in a little more detail with some practical applications in the next video.
Until then, stay safe.